Well, it is July 26th, 2022. I'm sitting here with Sean Thacker at Holly Spring, Mississippi. Uh, thank you for joining us today on behalf of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Project. Uh, could you give us your uh, date of birth and where you were born? Yeah. Uh, my date of birth is February 7th, 1985. I was born uh, in Bolingbrook, Illinois, outside Chicago. Okay. Could you tell us a little bit about your parents and what they did? Sure. Um, my parents, my mom primarily stayed at home. Uh, she did a couple side jobs here and there as needed, just if money got tight and everything. But my father was um, a minister full time. Um, I say that, but it's kind of funny because he usually had to do side work too, because most ministers don't make a, a lot. Um, but uh, so they did a lot of traveling, helping churches across the country uh, and even in Canada. So did you grow up in Bolingbrook? I did not. We lived there for about a year and then moved to St. Louis. My father moved there to help my grandfather out with uh, a church that my grandfather was the pastor at. And so grew up in St. Louis the rest of my life um, until recently moving to Holly Springs. And can you tell us a little bit about growing up in St. Louis as a kid? Sure. Uh, I grew up in North County. I don't know how familiar you are with St. Louis, but um, it, for, a small for a smaller city, I mean, it's not Chicago, it's not New York, not LA. It's very, it's got very div diverse culture. And um, growing, up, growing up in North County, it was very communal. Everybody, a uh, very Catholic-based city, um, St. Louis. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of St. Uh, municipalities. And um, in North County, very communal. A lot of friends. Um, everybody knew, really, kind of everybody, or at least somebody that knew that person, you know, who owned what shops and sort of things. So. And what did you do for fun as a kid? Oh man, I grew so I grew up in the '90s, y'all. <laughs> in the '90s, uh, everything from you know video video games are starting to become a popular thing. Uh, still enjoy them today, um, but I loved getting out, playing sports with some friends. Um, you know, Nerf was kind of you know just little kids things. You know, going around shooting Nerf guns, playing basketball at this park across the street, or or uh, running around and taking your bike, um, going several neighborhoods away, you know, and nobody thought anything of it. Um, you know, a lot of, lot of mix between indoors, outdoors, friends, lone time, all that. So uh, it was really good childhood. This is Patrick. Uh, Mr. Thacker, could you please elaborate a little bit about your education growing up? Sure. So I grew up, like I said, in North County of uh, St. Louis. Growing up, went to public school um, all my life. Um, went all through middle school, high school. Um, started to go to college. Um, and this is a very unique instance because I'm not, it, I'm all an advocate for college. Obviously, I'm doing this interview. Um, but I was going to college for, I don't want to say selfish, no, no, I was going for selfish reasons. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I'm a minister now and uh, God was kind of speaking to me, saying, letting me know that I was kind of going my way, not really the way he had for me, um, which I, both options were appealing to me. It wasn't like, uh, you know, I felt like I was, you know, so I did some college to answer your question. I, uh, but I, I felt I needed to stop and go into starting to uh, learn ministry, at least for me, you know. Uh, and I, I would never advise anybody to do that unless they specifically felt like me that, you know, God was saying, hey, you're going for the wrong reason, you know, kind of thing. Uh, as a follow up, uh, when did you find your calling um, uh, to preach, to be a minister? That is an excellent question. <laughs> So um, 
I've grown up, I've grown up in church all my life. Um, but I had a time late high school, college age where, and I, I kind of, you know, as a kid, I thought, you know, I'll be a preacher or I, you know, my father's a preacher and it felt like, you know, I, I could see myself doing that. Um, but late high school, early college years, uh, I think everybody goes through that time where you're starting to like, is that really me though? You know, um, I didn't even know if I believed in God at that point, you know, uh, just going through a lot of questions and of faith, life, all sorts of stuff. Well, God kind of, I mean, not to get overly spiritual here, but God kind of reached me in my room when nobody was around and started becoming more personal. It wasn't just, oh, that's what my parents do or that's what so-and-so does. No, that's what Sean Thacker uh, does. And it, and it became very personal at that point. Uh, but I still didn't know if I was necessarily called to preach at that point. You know, I just know that God did something amazing in my life. Uh, then about fall, I can tell you the exact day now. That's how clear uh, it was, October 23rd, 2005. Some of you are like, man, I was like, you know, <laughs> really young. Uh, October 23rd, 2005, I remember where I was standing right when it happened. I'm in a church service and I was questioning. I was like, well, God, I don't know if you're calling me because, you know, so-and-so says they're calling. And I'll be honest. I think that's just selfish ambition, all this stuff, a lot of stuff. Because sometimes we gauge, and I did, what what's a God's trying to do in our lives based on what somebody else. And I'm like, well, that's somebody else, you know. Well, finally, God's like, no, I've called you. Stop questioning it. You, you need to be okay with claiming that. And I was like, okay. And from then on, I knew. So long story, but. What denomination did your father preach in? He preached in the United Pentecostal Church. Okay. And you do the same? I do. Okay. Um, can you talk about a little expand upon your, your relationship with God growing up, you know, from you know, childhood to getting in college? Was it consistent? Did it wane? What was that like? Oh, absolutely waned. I mean, you know, you just, again, uh, my parents were good parents. They were good godly parents. You know, it wasn't like, it wasn't that they preached one thing or did another. It wasn't like that at all. It was just... When you're talking about anything spiritual, especially God-related things, um, it's never, the community is good, but the community can't do it for you. God is not, I mean, he, yes, he has a community of the church and, and believers, but he absolutely wants an individual relationship with every single person. So um, with that being said, people who grow up in church naturally they fight the, the struggle of, well, I'm, I'm doing it. Yeah, that's what my parents do. It's tradition. But it's got to go beyond that. And for me, it was the same way. You know, I, that's where I got to where I was like, well, I don't even know if I believe in God. Because um, at some point in all of our lives, we've all felt something spiritual. Whether we attribute it to God or not, we've all felt that. And not really recognizing it and being able to um, respond, I, I would say, it was something that in church you grow up, you know, you're like, you kind of get accustomed. It's like, if you go get pizza every night, eventually, do you even know what the pay, taste of pizza, how it differs from a hamburger, <laughs> you know? Like, it, I know that sounds so silly, but it's very true, even in a spiritual sense. So I didn't know what I had until it started to wane. And once I realized that was, um, I was, again, in it for the wrong reasons. I was just in it because so-and-so or this or that. And then when it became personal, then yeah, I started really feeling spiritual things that you, you just, you don't until it becomes personal. I don't know how else to say it. This is Alexandra. You mentioned earlier at the beginning that growing up, your dad would help churches across the country. Can you expand more on that? Yeah. So he grew, my parents both grew up in St. Louis. Um, my dad was not born in St. Louis, but, uh, that's, he really, um, that's when he became a Christian. He had a conversion experience. Um, I won't go into details there for sake of time, but very personal again. Um, so he, he felt called to ministry and wasn't sure just like many young ministers, not everybody's under, understood. There's no manual out there saying, well, you need to do this, this, and this, this, you know, they, Somebody probably should put one out there. But um, 
so he goes to his pastor and says, you know, I really feel called to preach and, and maybe pastor eventually. And so his pastor really helped him say, well, why don't you go try and help out? And there was a church in Chicago um, that he had made a connection with the pastor there and knew uh, a fam through family connections and, and just friends and uh, in church. And, and he needed some help. And so he reached out to my dad, um, smaller growing church. And uh, my dad reached out to his pastor and said, hey, you know, this bro brother is asking me to come help and we really feel we should go. Do we have, you know, what do you think? And it was just more so they, they want to make sure because sometimes, and I, I, there's wisdom in ch checking with elders and people that have lived on this earth <laughs> a long time just to, you know, and uh, he's like, yeah, I think it's a good, I think it's a good idea. You know, and so he went, started in Chicago. Um, that was before my days, before I was even on this earth. Um, they went up to Canada, believe it or not, Fort St. John, British Columbia, um, to help out a church. And uh, they started a ch church there. They started a church, uh, no church, in, uh, at least in the uh, apostolic faith uh, in Fort St. John. And um, he, I remember, this was again before me. This was my, I have three sisters. My middle sister was born there. And they talk about life lessons you learned there. They said that you, you didn't, they didn't know this until they got there, but a candle can put off enough heat to keep you alive in a car if you're stuck in a snowstorm. Just a candle, you know? So little things like that, but uh, they weren't up there too long, came back. Um, my grandfather took and passed, started pastoring a church in Chicago. He asked my, my father to come help assist him. So my dad did. And uh, again, helping another church grow and um, then they eventually moved to St. Louis and my dad and mother followed, uh, soon thereafter. So. And so this day, October 23rd, 2005, if I remember it right. So you get that message. What happens after? Do you just drop like immediately out of college or? <laughs> Believe it or not, I dropped out of college before that. Okay. More so because, and it's weird because I, I wasn't really a spiritual person when that happened, um, I'll be honest. Um, but I kind of, it's just, a, it was kind of interesting. I knew the, I'll tell you. So I was going to school for secondary education because I wanted to coach football. Uh, and I, I was convinced, and I'm not necessarily entirely sure I was wrong that I could have probably gone up to even NFL level at some, to some degree. Um, but I, I realized, so what, I'm gonna be teaching kids just for the purpose of teaching, you know, like, shouldn't you have a passion for teaching? <laughs> you, know? you know, I don't, I wouldn't want my students feeling like they were just a means to an end, you know, so, um, so God kind of ha helped me cut, kind of cut through my own mess, more or less. Mm -hmm. And um, at, right after that moment that you mentioned, though, um, again, I didn't necessarily know what that you know, looked like, what that meant. I just, I, there were certain things I knew to do. Certain, a lot of things I didn't have any clue about, but the things I knew to do, that's what I started doing. You know, I was praying, reading, my, studying my Bible, um, studying different texts and commentaries and different things like that, but also loving people. I mean, serving, I mean, that's what minister, minister means, a servant. Loving people. Um, I like what uh, someone else said earlier, you know, loving people really in an unconditional way. When, even when you know they're making a bad decision and you're doing your best to tell them and they make it anyway, you're still being there, you know, that and that can, I mean, really, God gave me that desire. He gave me that, that want to love people like that. Um, so it was a long process. <laughs> you know, a lot, of le uh, a lot of reading, a lot of counseling on, okay, what now? You know, uh, and a lot of praying. And so I hope that kind of answers your question. Uh, could you talk about Pentecostalism and how it is, uh, I guess, in compared to other Christian denominations? Sure. So the term Pentecostalism is tied to um, a part in Scripture 
the day of Pentecost, which was really an ancient Jewish feast called the Feast of Weeks. Okay, um, they termed it Pentecost because it was 50 days after Passover. So that's where the Penti, you know, prefix comes from. And uh, on the day of Pentecost, you know, um, after Jesus ascends, he tells the disciples and all these people that saw him, which is in interesting because over 500 people saw him, but only 120 show up, which is interesting when you think about it. But 120 people, he, tell, he says, go, you know, wait in Jerusalem, wait in, the, uh, in this upper room, which a lot of scholars believe it was the same upper room that they had the Last Supper in um, until, you know, so there's a, you know, you receive power from on high. There's going to be something that supernatural that happens, but they had no clue what that means, you know. So um, Pentecostalism, a lot of Pentecostals attribute themselves to that experience of receiving the Holy Spirit by speaking and the evidence of speaking in tongues and that supernatural evidence that follows that. Um, so that's where I, that's where most Pentecostals differ than say a lot of other Protestant or even uh, Catholicism, other Christian denominations is that if something supernatural is gonna happen such as speaking, you know, receiving the Holy Spirit, that something will be shown. It, there will be evidence, you know, it's not just take someone's word for it, you know. Um, and it happened then in the book of Acts. Um, interesting enough, what led me back to it because I, again, my faith waned, okay? So there was a point where I was like, I don't care who's right. I don't care if Christianity's right. I don't care if Islam's right. I don't care who's right. Just show me who's right. And when I'm in that state, in my room, is when that same experience happened. And I, and I was like, so there was no choir, no preacher. <laughs> you know, nobody's saying, well, you just believe that because I'm like, it happened in my room, guys. There was nobody else around but me and Jesus. You know, like, so... Uh, in, a, in a nutshell, that's what the, really the distinguishing factor is for Pentecostals in particular. All right, this is Chloe Choi, but um, I know that you talked a little bit about your dad, your grandfather. I actually wanted to hear a little bit more about the women in your life and how they impacted you and your faith. Absolutely. Obviously, the most um, closest woman in my life uh, at the time would have been my mother. Um, my mother, if you met her, you would think she was an angel. <laughs> she's about 4'11". She'll say she's 4'11 and three quarters. That's what they all say. She's, yep, <laughs> short, short redheaded lady and uh, has an absolute love for God. And when you have, when you really, really, truly, and this is something, you know, I hope this doesn't burst anybody's theology or anything, but if you truly, truly love God, you're going to love people. There's no way you cannot. Anybody that says they love God and does not love people is a liar. Okay. Um, so, and you can tell that woman, she was always praying for me. And she didn't always know the struggles. Our parents don't always know. Sometimes our closest friends don't know what we're going through, you know. And because uh, sometimes the, it's an internal struggle, whether it's in your mind or whatever. And, uh, but she was always nurturing always a voice that and she's the most approachable person so if you were struggling with man i shouldn't be doing this or or you know i got into this trouble i could always talk to mom dad a little more intimidating <laughs> <laughs> but i mean uh, in, in a way a father almost has to be though you know i know i'm not not in a bad way but a mother is a is almost like that counterbalance you know that can you she she's the voice that you can go to and dad almost has to be the correcting voice. I'm not saying, you know, don't get me wrong. There's people that go way too far with that. But, and I, I didn't think my father did. He think he did a good job, but my mother was the, someone that would always, you, you knew it's okay. It's okay, baby. I'm here for you. I love you. We're going to get through it. God loves you. If you're, you know, he's not going to, he's not going to give up on you. you know? So, very, very instrumental. And even my grandmother. Um, uh, there, I'm blessed to have uh, one grandmother still alive today. And uh, they are both a lot of joy to be around. 
I was hoping you could talk about kind of the links in the history of the Pentecostal church and civil rights and human rights in America. Sure. I will be honest. I don't know every detail on that. Um, I know, and I, I can't speak all, even for all United Pentecostal apostolic churches. You know, we call ourselves apostolic Pentecostal. Um, I do know that many times, uh, even, even in civil rights movement, even back in um, during the Civil War, there were a lot of uh, spirit-filled people that just saw what was going on and couldn't, they, they, they were involved in the Underground Railroad. They were, they, because they, they realized, you know what, these, these are God's people too. You know, the, God does not see superior or inferior. He sees us all equal overall as children. So um, I, I will say this though, and this is true with any church, any church, just like any other organization in the world, there's always going to be influences um, from outside that try to affect what's going on, for good or bad. Um, and that's true of any organization. That's true of governments. That's true of corporations. It's true of churches, any community of people. Um, and sometimes the churches would allow good things to influence them sometimes. And I'm not just talking about Pentecost, I'm talking about churches in general. Sometimes they'd let, um, especially, and I, again, I'm new to the South, but sometimes in the South, just a way of life, whether it was bad or good, they would let that kind of affect their view more so than their faith. Well, in my, in, my, in my Bible, it says we shouldn't be doing that anyway. You know, it's like, look, you, you, your faith should be what determines it, not just, okay, because so-and-so thinks, you know, that, um, you know, African-Americans are, are, aren't worthy of these services. That doesn't mean you should be attributing that, you know. So to answer your question, I think there are a lot of churches, there's a lot of internal talk with a lot of the churches saying, hey, we, we are, we need to be in this, this force. You know, I mean, Martin Luther King was a, a Baptist minister, you know, so there is the church saw, hey, we need to get involved, but there's always that separation of church and state. So how involved do we get, you know, kind of thing. But I think a lot of them said, well, we got to do something, you know, now we, we may not be able to change everybody's mind, but we can be part of that change and at least show love to our brothers, you know, brothers and sisters. So I hope that answers your question. I think so. I mean, maybe a follow up, you know, how do you think, how do you square that sometimes people will take opposite political views or opposite moral views, but use the same religious belief to justify that? Sure. So, sorry for the full filter there. Um, I think from the church's perspective, and this is also, remember, I, I can't speak for everybody. I'm speaking for Sean Thacker. Um, I think the balance is knowing that peop, you can have people that disagree with you and yet still love them as a person and still care that, hey, I understand that maybe they see differently. That's still someone Jesus died for. That's still someone that God created. So I'm going to, as, as church people, we try to connect on that human level and say, Hey, we all, and that truth, truthfully, all the all of uh, scriptures and everything, God really is about the human experience being the best experience it can be. You know, I know a lot of people know about the do's and don'ts, but that's it's that's why Jesus even came. He's like, I came so you have life more abundantly. He came so people could actually have joy and peace and all these things. And um, but. To answer your question again, sorry, I'm a preacher, guys. You got <laughs> a little long-winded. Um, I think in a lot of times we look at it, okay, is this a moral issue? Is it a political issue? If it's a political issue, I think a lot of times churches can say, you know, it's a political difference. You know, we'll, we try to not, we try to stay kind of, it's going to be funny. I'm going to use this term, but agnostic to the political world. Because I mean, because not to say that uh, we don't vote. We do vote. 
Um, but just to say that, you know, ultimately we're living for the Lord, you know, we're living for God. Um, we, you know, not to say we're not, we won't be involved or anything, but again, it's like, we're looking honestly for heaven. You know, we're not expecting this earth to ever be heaven. And not to say that we don't want to improve it and make things better. Obviously we want to, it's in fact, it's kind of our duty to, right? To do what we can to improve things. Um, I'm, thank God for electricity. Thank God that we're not, you know, without air conditioning. Thank God there was somebody that said, we need to do something about this heat. But, um, but I think from a, if it's a moral issue, we, I think we still try to stand our ground and say, look, we do stand on this morally, but that does not mean we're going to hate anybody on the opposite side. It doesn't mean we're going to... Now, again, just like any organization, you will get some people that are extreme and not really. They're the bad apples. I, I don't know how else to say it, okay? And then they say, well, I'm a part of this, this, this church or I'm part of this corporation. Well, in a church, you can't fire them. <laughs> you just can't fire them. Because, um, again, we're trying to get people to be more like Jesus, think more like him. So um, while we stand on those moral grounds, we're not hating. We're not spewing fire. We're not trying to say, well, you guys are idiots. Or, we don't say that because that's not how we feel. We're like, look, these are still people. There's still people God loves. There's still people Jesus died for. And we actually care for them. So... How is the church you um, are a minister at involved in Holly Springs? Absolutely. So keep in mind, I moved down here in February. So okay. I'm very, very new recent. to the area. Yeah. Very new. Um, actually, it's funny you said that because um, our pastor's wife spoke on Sunday morning. And she talked about the church being that community, just reminding us. And that's a, a lot of sermons are just that, sometimes reminders. As human beings, we just tend to forget. Life happens, right? We all have to pay bills. We're all you know, going through. And we need those reminders. And she talked about the church being that safe community. That if somebody is dealing with an addiction or if somebody's broken or somebody's not got the best home life or maybe they don't come from uh, the same uh, background or maybe they're a different race or maybe they're different, they, have, they don't make as much money or whatever, poverty level. The church is the place that God designed for everybody to be able to come together on an even playing field and just worship our creator, love each other as brothers and sisters as a family should, you know, um, and just being that safe place. And it takes a concerted effort because otherwise, again, we can just get in our normal routine of, well, I'm doing my job nine to five and going to the grocery store and, I, and we, we can we forget I actually have to put effort in crossing the boundaries, even though, you know, maybe somebody's ready for it, maybe they're not, and just saying, hey, I'm here for you. Do you, do you, need, do you need anything, you know? Um, so we actively are, are that, that body in the, in the area saying, hey, who are you reaching out to? Who, as a neighbor, are you telling people about what God did for you? How maybe you were... Um, in a broken home, or maybe you were had an abusive stepfather or whatever, and how are you connecting with people around you? So I hope that, again, that answers your question. Uh, what kind of responsibility do you feel a pastor has to their congregation in terms of their beliefs or morality or faith? Okay, that's a great question. <laughs> Um, so I'm not the pastor at the church. Uh, again, me and my wife, we moved down here to help the pastors. However, we do feel called to be pastors. Um, so that's a very good question because I've thought about it a lot. I think a pastor has the moral obligation to love God's people and all people. I, I say God's people as a church, you know, but even outside that, and a pastor does, a good pastor does, because um, he knows that everybody on the earth, again, is, was created by God. And so, you know, and I, and I get, I'm not taking away the science, obviously, of all that's involved in that. But again, he loves, all, he's got that moral obligation to love people, no matter what state they're in. 
no matter how difficult they are to deal with. Because let's be honest, you guys have dealt with difficult people too. Maybe it's fellow students, maybe it's, again, a teacher that just seems to like not be in your, you know, on your, in your corner or whatever it may be. You've dealt with difficult people too. Um, but loving those difficult people, no differently. Um, but as far as teaching, a pastor has the, also the moral and God-given responsibility to speak what the Word of God says no matter what. And I know, because I had to preach on Sunday night, because our pastor was traveling, it is not always fun. Because it, you want to always talk about the fun things, the good things, you know, but sometimes you have to say, look, you have to talk about what's wrong. And if someone's doing wrong, and again, remember, y'all, I, I believe wholeheartedly in the Bible. If someone's living in sin, they're going to end up in hell. And, and I have to tell them that. In fact, the, the Bible, even tell, God even tells one of the prophets, Ezekiel, he's like, look, if you don't tell them, Yes, they're still going to suffer and die, but you're gonna, their blood's going to be on your hands. So if you don't tell them and try to help them get away from that, I'm going to require it of you because I sent you. And it's, it's like it would be like a professor at, at UF that's supposed to speak on a topic, but they're not willing to talk about the hard parts of that topic. Well, would you feel like you were getting the education that you deserve if they're will, not willing to talk about the hard stuff. It's no different for a pastor. You know, uh, in fact, probably more so because you're talking about not just things about in the physical and earthly, but you're talking about eternal spiritual things. So I hope that, again, yes, answers your question. And then how do, you know, non-theological social sciences, like in this case, history, kind of inform the ministry or yourself as a pastor? Sure. Um, I love history, first of all, and I didn't even know how much history is in Holly Springs until I got down here. My pastor was like, man, there's so much history here. Um, I think history in a lot of ways, um, there, I, I don't know. This is maybe my personal perception. Okay. Um, sometimes you'll see history and the Bible line up and sometimes you'll see, is there, is there some discrepancies? Um, and then you realize both were written by men, <laughs> you know, at some point. So, you know, I wasn't here when Christopher Columbus sailed across the ocean. In fact, I, none of us were. So it's, in a way, you're taking it by faith that, okay, maybe they recorded it as accurately as they could, or, or did they skew it, you know? In the Bible, it's it, a lot of times, I was actually studying this recently, um, they talk about the, uh, in the Old Testament, before Hubble telescope, before telescopes were invented, they mentioned planets. I'm like, how did they even know there were planets that existed? And, and Job, it talks about God sitting on the circle of the earth before nobody thought the earth was round. So there's, it's funny how a lot of times, the more I study the word, the more I realize history, science, the word, they actually do line up. Now, are there some areas that we don't know about? Sure. Um, but again, 2022, Sean Thacker and all of us sitting here, you know, we weren't there when, you know, uh, the dinosaurs or, uh, you know, we weren't there. So we didn't really know how it could, we can only do what we know as far as carbon dating science and history and that. Um, ultimately, they're both, they're both taken a little by faith, <laughs> if you will, you know, um, but I, I find it, I really love studying history because the more I study both, the more I see there's a lot of, more often than not, they do line up and you're like, oh, that is really cool. You know, I mean, a Babylonian captivity, Nebuchadnezzar, you find out that the Babylonian astrologers are the ones that first discovered planets. They didn't have telescopes, but they actually could see. Now, they didn't discover all the planets, but, you know, so... Just little things like that is very uh, fascinating. Uh, so I hope I answered you. again your question. And just a quick follow-up, like in, about recent history, you know, things that ancient history you take into faith, but recent history within people's lifetimes that people you know study and analyze. How about 
sure. guess that and that's a context. Can you give me like a specific example? Yeah, sure. Like the, you know, this whole trip is about the civil rights movement and, you know, the struggle for human rights in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Yeah. Um, I, I think I understand your question, so I'll answer how I, I perceive, you know, the question being asked. Um, the church acknowledges it as far as the fact that um, our African-American brothers and sisters were, uh, were mistreated heavily. Um, it, 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 would be, it would be odd for us to attribute that the you know, Egyptians mistreated the Israelites, but us not to acknowledge you know, African-American people were mistreated in the United States for a very long time. You know? But honestly, it, it even extends beyond just that race. Like, I mean, there, during the Civil or during the World War II, um, you had a very anti-Japanese culture in the United States. In Europe, they had a very anti-Semitic view. You know, uh, and, uh, and everybody, you know, blames Nazi Germany. But if you look, it was actually across all of Europe. So I think the church acknowledges that with humanity, you're going to have flaws. Not that we're okay with just, oh, well, we're, we're just flawed and we're just gonna have to deal with it. But just to acknowledge that and say, how do we do better? How can the church be on the front lines of leading and showing people how we can actually love each other? Truly, you know, I, I will tell you wholeheartedly, I believe that you really can't do that truly without God's spirit, with the Holy Spirit, because he really does give you his love. You can do it to a degree, but I think without it, it's, it's a lot more difficult. Let me put it that way, because you only see things from your perspective, but God is very em empathetic. He lets you see that, oh, I'm just one of what, 7 billion now, or close to 8 billion. I mean, yes, he still cares about me and I'm still important, but I'm also part of the whole human race. Does that make sense? So we do acknowledge that. In fact, we do everything we can to um, be that driving force that says, hey, if you see prejudice anywhere else, let it not be in the church because we love our brothers and sisters. You know, again, are you going to have some bad apples? Are you going to have some people? Remember, people come into the church and there are all different walks with God, just like in education. You know, when you come as a freshman at UF, you're not at the same degree as if you're at a senior level, right? You're still learning. You're still growing. It's the same in the church. So unfortunately, yeah. Are there any more questions from my colleagues? Um, what would you say um, the most relevant lesson you've learned from the church or from ministry in general is relevant today or that you'd like people today to remember? Sure. I would say, and this is funny because I would say it came from my current pastor. Uh, he was my youth pastor at the time in St. Louis. And he talked about something called hermene hermeneutics, which is simply how to study the Bible in its correct context. Because let's be honest, y'all, it's an old text. I mean, it's, it's one of the oldest existing texts we have today in that kind of form, you know, especially religion, religious-based. So taking a 2,000-plus-year-old text, how does that apply to 2022? You know, they didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have McDonald's. They didn't have all these things. But finding the principles that are timeless and how do we apply that? Like, for instance, loving your neighbor as yourself. And, you know, people in that day were trying to justify, well, who's my neighbor? Well, Jesus pointed out pretty much just anybody. Anybody in need, anybody around you, that's your neighbor. It's not literally just the person next door. And so taking those principles and applying them today and thinking, Lord, would you be pleased with that? I know I'm not going to be perfect. Nobody's going to be perfect. And we could beat ourselves up over striving for, for perfection, but I'm still going to strive, you know, and God's going to help me, help us, right? But ultimately, I would say that's the thing I learned the most was how to read God's Word, how to apply it. Because otherwise, if you're reading this genealogy in the Old Testament, but you're not seeing how it kind of correlates with the rest of scriptures, it's, 
<laughs> Let's be honest, guys. It's not the most exciting read when you see here, he begat, he begat, he begat, he begat. I mean, so I think that was the biggest thing I've learned is not only how to read it, how to apply it, how it, it, it applies, right? Um, and how it really can come alive if you just really let it, you know? Um, many other things, but that would probably be the number one. Okay. That was my last question, if anybody... Oh. An easier one. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, you've been in the Holly Springs for a few months now. How do you like it? Um, how do you find people here, um, the culture, that kind of thing? I love this question. And this is an easier question. <laughs> so, again, grew up in St. Louis, grew up in a bigger city. Um, obviously nothing like New York, you know, Chicago, but... Um, Coming to a smaller town like Holly Springs, I know we're an hour southeast of Memphis. I get that. But it is very small town feel. It's also south. We're in the south, y'all. And see, it even got me, y'all. <laughs> you know. Um, I struggled the first week or two because I'm very outgoing, very people-oriented, very love the convenience of the city. And... You know, we came down here, we came from a faster paced life, and it's not like that. Not only in a small town, but in the South in general, it's a slower pace. Now, Florida is a little different. I mean, it's, it's a little different. But when you're talking about like South, rural South, it's definitely a slower pace. But I actually like it. You can actually enjoy it. If you add a book you've been wanting to read, you can actually have some time to just kick back and actually, you mean I don't have to do anything this night? I can actually just enjoy this book or this show that, or whatever. Yeah, you can. And nobody's gonna be like, well, why weren't you at, so, you know? Because everybody's a little, now that comes with pros and cons, you know, when you need to get things done. <laughs> but. Um, when you want like Ethiopian food or something. Oh yeah, <laughs> yes, it definitely, you don't have, and I, I'll tell you a type of food I love. I love Indian food, I love Lebanese food, I, I, I'm very, adventurous on different types of food. I love Japanese food. Um, but yeah, you don't have as many options. Um, luckily, we're only an hour southeast of Memphis if we really want to try something a little bit more uh, different, you know. And uh, But I would say this, that first week I struggled, again, rural south, not a, not a country guy, not handy. Um, have you guys been to the city square? Okay. When you go, it's not, it's nothing. Okay. Uh, trust me. It's nothing. It's not <laughs> Miami, but that I'll tell you, and God knew I needed it. That actually helped me just having a center as small as it is. <laughs> you guys are going to laugh when you can see it. Like Sean Dagger was talking about this, but it did something for me. Just like, okay, there was a hub of civilization here. God, I can do this. <laughs> you know, like, so, um, but other than that, it's also hot. And I hate the heat. I love cold weather. And I was like, God, why couldn't you have called me to Alaska or something? You know, like, but uh, but I, I will tell you, the longer we've been here, and there, and again, not to sound overly spiritual, but again, God is literally every a part of everything in my life. If, there, if you're going to live for God, there's no other way to do it. Um, I feel His peace. I feel His joy. Like the, I, we're here because he called us here and we know that and we feel that every time, not only we connect with the church, but people in the area. And there's a peace and a joy and an excitement, all that that comes with that, that you just really can't put on anything else. Um, the town itself is nice. Um, it's got a lot of history. Walter Place has got some awesome history. If you guys ever want to Google it, um, cross the street. Uh, but it, yeah, it, it's, it's been a pleasant experience. Not without challenges, but pleasant. Um, well, I guess we might be wrapping up. If no one else can think of any more questions, but we'll give you a chance to, you know, are there any questions we that you wish we had asked or just any final notes that you want to leave us on? Um, I would say not really any questions maybe that you guys didn't ask or anything. Um, or, or, I, okay, maybe. You guys, uh, did you guys just drive in today? Yes. Okay. 
Are you guys sticking around for any length of time, meaning a day or anything? Are you? Yeah, we're spending a night here, and then we will be back here again tomorrow night. Okay. Well, um, if you guys haven't had good barbecue, <laughs> I will tell you. Uh, I was telling, um, oh, I forget his name. He's from Italy. Um, oh, yeah. I was telling him about 45 minutes northwest of here, South Haven, has a place that is excellent. It's been on Food Network. Um, Bible, or the uh, Bible, the best barbecue ribs in the area. Uh, it's called Memphis Barbecue Company. And uh, that's one thing I will say about the South. <laughs> okay, this is going to sound fun. This is going to sound funny. So I always like to, I don't, I don't do a ton of research. My wife is the big researcher. She loves researching. But I looked up, you know, and apparently Mississippi is the most obese state. Well, there's a reason, y'all. The food <laughs> yeah. is incredible. If you find the right place, you're going to be like, no wonder. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, good good places. So yeah. We're ready for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm, you're like, this is not the time to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm vegetarian, but the only thing I miss, sorry, this is going to be part of the interview, but it's really That's not okay. relevant, is barbecue and like a pulled pork sandwich oh my god it makes me reconsider being vegetarian every single day almost yeah i get it i get it <laughs> so oh. now if we go to that place i'm gonna be like i can't even go in here because i'm not gonna be vegetarian if i, I go you. in there <laughs> well and the nice thing is there's some good places with good vegetables in the area too like, yeah they, they're I mean, good no the, the grilled the vegetables are good too but if i even just like with see you. other people and I start smelling the barbecue, I'll be like, maybe Yeah, one. you don't want to torture yourself. Like, don't yeah. torture yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, so. um, yeah, on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you for doing this interview, and we really enjoyed it. Well, thank you for asking me. Yeah.